something similar myself in, in our office, which would um, set it all up for us. Uh, as Ron said, I, I have 32 years in the NYPD. I've probably been through all of the changes that most of us could relate to. I was around the NAP Commission, but know a lot about that. You know, New York right now is going through a, another trying time. The ramifications of stop and frisk are detrimental in two aspects. They're detrimental to the people who are complaining about stop and frisk, and they're detrimental to the people who haven't complained about stop and frisk. There's a problem, and those people are, in my view, mostly the good people in New York City. Uh, not to say that the people in the minority communities are the bad people, but like anything else, if I'm a fisherman, I go to the ocean to fish. I don't come into Midtown to fish. If I'm looking for criminals and I'm going to address high crime and violent crimes, I go to communities where these crimes are occurring on an everyday basis. I don't need to have an influx of cops on the Upper East Side of Manhattan when there's really no shootings occurring on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. But there may be three or four today in parts of Brooklyn North. In the course of it all, the city has, the department has implemented a lot of different strategies. And truth be told, all the strategies that are in place, in my view, are a result of um, Bill Bratton when he first came into the city of New York and implemented a program called ComStat. If we go back into the 70s, the 80s, and the early parts of the 90s, um, we were probably very close to having the streets of Baghdad and Afghanistan here in Times Square and parts of Brooklyn. Um, you couldn't ride the trains. People were being pushed into the trains. It was a tourist um, on the 42nd, I think, and 6th. Um, whole family was in for the U.S. Open. It was staff right in front of his parents and killed. The business left the city. Um, people didn't want to live in the city. You saw gates on all the apartments and you know the little walk-ups. You know, the little grand grandmother and grandfather going into the buildings were getting brutally beaten and robbed. It was an everyday occurrence. Back then, we had a unit called the uh, Senior Citizen Dropper Unit. We don't have that anymore. It's not an issue. So times changed, but they changed when Bratton came into play. Uniformed police officers prior to Bratton would walk into a house of prostitution, a narcotics location, and were under direct orders to not make arrests. You couldn't make arrests in a narcotics location. You couldn't make an arrest in a gambling location or a house of prostitution. So you would call the police and you'd say that there's narcotics being sold in my building in the third floor apartment, and the police would come. And we'd walk out and the people would stay behind. And we would fill out what was an intelligence report. The intelligence report would get broken down and sent into the narcotics division. And six weeks later, they would come after making two other other buys and make an arrest. So six more weeks, narcotics would be sold, prostitution would continue, and eventually they'd be an arrest. And the arrest process you'd go through, and two days later they're back in business again. This was the way things were done. And why was it done that way? Fear of corruption. It was on the heels of the NAP Commission, and these policies came into place. How do we reduce these crimes? And we target these areas where the violent crimes are. And the people who are living in, in these areas don't understand police are here because we don't want your son getting killed. You know, you look at the numbers. You know, it's young teenage male blacks that are being killed. And who are they being killed by? Other teenage or other 20 male blacks. That's who's doing it. It's not a male boy in, in a shirt and tie who's a banker in Wall Street. Yeah, it happens sometimes, but it's not an everyday occurrence. So, who should we target? And what is being left out, any one of you, who has ever been a victim of a crime. Maybe not. The police officer responds. This is what happens. Well, you provide the story. You provide the description. So you're the one who's providing us with the information of who we should be looking for. This is all being left out. Stop and frisk is stop, question, and frisk. It's a uh, Supreme Court case of Terry v. Ohio. And I think it was back in the early 60s, maybe in the mid-60s. And really what stop and frisk is about is not just that we go out and we try to recover guns. It's, it's not, well, you listen to Judge Shindlin, 
we did five million stops. That might be the number. I'll jump in if you have the right number anywhere along. But we did five million stops and came up with two arrests. And I'm, I'm dramatizing the point. Well, the purpose of stop and frisk isn't to, well, it's not to go out and search people to get weapons. I could do that and you know, search everybody for weapons if that was the purpose of it. It's based on a common right of inquiry that leads to a, another phase of reasonable suspicion that leads to something else. So I'll give you an example. Is I'm working anti-crime and playing close with two other clients. And I notice an individual walking the curb line looking in claw windows. And he just keeps looking in claw windows. He goes up a block. You know, that happens, right? People are allowed to look in claw windows. But he gets to the end of the block and he crosses the street and he comes back this way looking at call windows. Well, again, looking back inside the call windows. What do you think he's doing? I think he's looking to see nice interiors of cars that maybe one day he wants to buy a car. It kind of looks homeless. Kind of looks like he's a street person. Doesn't really look like he has the ability to afford a car. But yet he does that. And he gets to the corner. He goes up the next block. But that's a main avenue. It's like 6th Avenue. It's too busy. So he goes up the side street again. Goes back up the street, northbound. Crosses over and comes back. Something. What do you think he's doing? He's looking for an opportunity to steal something from within a car, or possibly steal a car. So now a police officer goes up and says, what are you doing? Oh, I'm looking for my friend. Up and down the street looking at the windows. He sleeps in cars. It doesn't make sense. Okay. Where do you live? Um, I live in Brooklyn. On 16th Street, 6th Avenue, Manhattan. It's 1139. You live in Brooklyn. You going to the train? No, I'm waiting to get picked up by who? By my friend. What's your friend's name? All of his hands up. Is this a believable story to anybody right now? Because these are the stories we get. So it leads to the next step. So as part of Terry vs. Ohio, I'm now at a phase of questioning and building probable cause to something, whatever it may be. We don't know where we're going with this. But in the course of me asking questions, the purpose of Terry vs. Ohio was for me to make sure that I'm safe when asking these questions. That's the purpose of that law. Stop and frisk. And stop, question, and frisk. Because as I'm talking to him, he may be wanted on homicide. He may be wanted on a warrant. And I may be the only thing stopping him from going on with the rest of his night and his freedom. So he could easily take out of his pocket a pen, a screwdriver, or a firearm and decide to use it against me. The purpose of Terry vs. Ohio is for that moment in time for me to be able to raise the ball and say, let's see what you got on you, and toss him and see if he has any weapons on him. Now, what's a weapon? Is a screwdriver a weapon? Well, you can go into Home Depot and buy all the weapons you want. But the truth of the matter is, it can be used as a weapon. All right? A newspaper can be used as a weapon. You don't see it because you don't, see it cause you don't deal with it. And there's different ways that people create weapons. We have real guns that are spray-painted bright green with orange tips on them. Those kids play with those types of guns. So when you see in the street, it's just a kid's gun. That's a real gun. People do that. There's little tiny guns that they have. There's little tiny pen knives that penetrate the center of your chest, which is less than two inches to your heart. Those are weapons. So Terry vs. Ohio allowed those stops to occur so that the officer was safe. So when you hear Judge Shenlin say, well, you only make two arrests. Yeah, but I got 4,999,000 safe cops, which is really the purpose of the law. Does it look racial? Sure it does. Absolutely looks racial. Something's missing, and it's missing in the communication of it. My prediction is Judge Shinlin gets overturned in her decision. It's my understanding she's the most overturned judge, federal judge, in the country. And I've been to court with her already. She ruled against us in the past. I went to the appellate division, and she paid me $25 million later on. I beat her. So she, I believe, will be beaten again. And I've gone to Washington to discuss this case. We all see this as a Supreme Court case. So I just been able association about a week ago filed papers to join in with the appeal um, with the city. It would give us standing as we go forward. The judge still has to rule that we're allowed to join in on the appeal. My feeling is she's going to say we're not, but I'll appeal that to the leader and we'll go in on the appeal. So whoever the mayor is, this case is going to be appealed. It's not going to be an issue going forward. Um, crime is starting to spike a little bit in some areas. Shootings are up, gun arrests are down. So either it's just a bad month of September, or there's ramifications to this stop and frisk policy that's being created. And what city council did 
with the outside uh, uh, inspector general agency that they want to start, um, and the new law that they created is totally ludicrous. Inspector general, big deal. So there's another set of eyes that offers judgment and viewpoints as to what's better to be done in police. It's not the end of the world. Right. If you have a great idea and if you make it to Kelly's desk, why would you not want to at least be open to something? Be a great idea, right? <clears throat> None of us are smart and all of us combined, so why shut that down? But to implement a stop and frisk policy that City Council is doing effective January 1st, my sympathy goes to all of you, not to the police. Because as we go forward, it's the police who are labeled the bad guy. Everyone in this room, somewhere along the line, had our parents tell us if you ever lost, if there's ever a problem, go find a policeman. Well, the legislation that's passed in the City Council says that the police have to prove that they're telling the truth. That's what it says. And as we go forward, any of the um, stop and frisk that occur, if you feel that you were stopped because you're gay, you're not gay, you're an atheist, you're a Catholic, you're a Jew, you're a Muslim, you live in a public housing project, you're black, you're Hispanic, you're too short, too heavy. These are all reasons that you can file a complaint, and it's up to the police officer to defend his position of why he stopped you. Why would I want to stop you in the first place? If every time this happens, I'm on a defense. I do it. I get paid the same money. I have a family to worry about. I have a pension that's on the line. So what's in it for me that I get to sit back and go to court every day? And that's not the issue. You know, you. Some people scream, it's going to be very expensive. So it's very expensive. That's not the issue. The issue is that it has ramifications to public safety. And what City Council did was a play for votes in these upcoming elections. That's what they did. They sold votes on everybody else's back in the city of New York. And they should be held accountable for it. Unfortunately, we can't sue them. I actually wanted to stop charging them with accessories to crimes and things like that, but unfortunately they are um, um, immune from what they've done. They may have gone outside the scope of their abilities in passing these laws, and we're looking at that aspect of it and filing a lawsuit, trying to overturn it from a legal standpoint. Um, that stop and frisk, um, I was a kid in the city, I grew up in the West Village, um, I've seen all kinds of things. I, I knew people who carried guns in the streets, and fights with baseball bats, and people running from subways to get home to their building or back to the neighborhood where they were safe. I've seen that happen. And, and you know, my mother still lives in the West Village. You can walk around in the middle of the night, and there's cafes and restaurants and stores open in Times Square. In the late 80s, had 96 robberies a month on one block. On one block from 8th Avenue to 9th Avenue a month, every month consistently on one block. Disney's over there now, hotels are over there now, you know, world, world famous chain stores are there now. So somewhere as we go forward, the good people of the city have to come back to reality to say, no, this can't happen. And the issue of stop and frisk that is affecting the minority communities, they need to understand. In some way, we need to get that message across that you're part of the solution. You can't become part of the problem because it's your kids who are being killed. And, and I worked in some of these areas. Um, I, I saw two kids um, killed uh, off of Church Avenue in the middle of July. It was a beautiful day to have be a thousand people on the street. How many witnesses I got? Both killed, about 30, 40 feet apart on bicycles. Zero. Not one witness. So my first inclination is people here don't care. But then you get a little bit smarter and say, no, they're afraid. There's a difference. There's a difference. And that's a common occurrence in some of these areas. So Kelly's not wrong. And I'm the first one. Believe me, I have no problem throwing him into the fire pit. Um, he's not wrong. And you have to give credit where credit's in. He did a good job. He was confronted with terrorism over the years. It, you know, Brad didn't have that issue. Kelly took it to a whole new level with terrorism. And ultimately, the city's saying, and there's ramifications to that. You go into work, your children go to school, and tourism, and rents, and all the things that you know help the American dream, which is what everybody in the country is working for. There's ramifications to that. Questions on any of this? 
I'd love to just have you discuss, please, first, what is the SBA's role, what does the SBA do, and how can businesses help or be involved with the SBA? The SBA is basically the same as the PBA. Everybody hears the PBA. New York City Police has five different unions. There's police officers, detectives, sergeants, lieutenants, and captains, and the captains make up the inspectors and the chiefs. They're the smallest of all five unions. The PBA is the largest uh, police union in the country. Detectives, I believe, are the third largest police union in the country, and we're the fourth largest police union in the country. We have almost 5,000 members, which in some countries is bigger than some armies, and in this country, much larger than some police departments. I think Boston only has 2,500 police. I would have thought they'd have 10, 12,000. Um, so, size-wise, we're pretty big. Um, what we do in the SBA, my, my, my job is basically, um, Spokesperson for all sergeants in the NYPD. We uh, represent them in collective bargaining, contracts, health benefits, things along those lines, discipline, um, any types of uh, issues that I claim affect their overall well being. A sergeant whose house got swept out to sea during Hurricane Sandy, um, not listed anywhere in a contract that we have to help you, but we do. That's what the purpose of it is, is to deliver things back. So we negotiate a lot of the benefits. We try to represent them in a variety of ways. Um, the education, the legal benefits, um, discounts to programs that exist, we college discounts to uh, programs. We run scholarship programs for them. And we also oversee um, all of the widows uh, of sergeants and participate in the widows of police officers that were killed and, and the children of police officers that were killed over the years. We get involved in all of that stuff. Partnership with businesses? For well, partnerships with businesses, I, as, as much as I'm president of a labor organization, <coughs> I don't look at it like that. I look at it in the sense of um, this is a business, and even though we're a labor organization, the membership, in my view, are stockholders to a company, and they're supposed to get dividends back. Um, you see a lot of labor organizations, even across the country, they're being crushed. And it's, I need another break. So you got three breaks today. I need uh, another check. I need a bigger pension. Um, and you have to pay for my meals. And it's an ask, it's an ask, it's an ask. And I get that. You know, it's buying a house. You want the best price. And I get you're always asking. But the reverse of it is that we're a large organization. And we have the ability to do a lot of things on our own. I try to take it to a whole different level of teaming up with businesses and creating a more positive image and giving things back and, you know, in the same process, um, opening up different doors to different things, working with schools, you know, colleges, right, you get uh, cops to go to school and get them a discount in the process for it rather than themselves and their families, so there's a benefit to that. The schools like that idea because they're getting a reach to all of New York City police officers through the process. And I also have the ability to give them the reach to police officers across the country, and in some cases, the military. So there's a real benefit to them. We created different things along the lines. We made a boot. It was the official boot of NYPD sergeants. We give it to every sergeant who gets promoted. And the game plan with that was to try to take it public. So that when you went to Models or to Sporting Goods or wherever it was, you see this boot, and it's one by the uh, NYPD sergeants. I'm in the process of putting together a wellness program, and I am trying to partner up with um, uh, on TV all the time. I'm not a brain player right now. Um, it's the fitness uh, equipment that they now want. Can't believe I'm lying on this one. Bowflex? Bowflex. That was a test question. Um, <laughs> I'm not paying attention. <laughs> Bowflex. We're, we're talking with Bowflex right now. What I'm looking to do is implement a wellness program for sergeants and their families, and as they opt in, give them a piece of cardio equipment, <coughs> partnered up with Bowflex. We're talking with Bowflex, I may need like 4,000 bikes if everybody would opt in, or close to 5,000 bikes. We have the money to do it, I'll get a lot better price than the average person will. <coughs> so Bowflex has a benefit to that also, that they can, you know, advertise that NYPD sergeants are using their equipment and it you know, gives them credibility to the brand. So we're working on that. 
we have doctors that are willing to become part of the program. So Trainers, nutritionists, I'm sorry? Said Juan can really spin that. Yeah. Well, we're not. We're probably January to spin that. No bike. He can spin that. So we're, we're trying to partner in that sense in a much larger scale that gives good things to the members. Um, we improve their health. So what's the benefit to us? And we just give a bike away. No, as their health improves, our insurance experience improves. So our rates will change. So in some ways, it funds itself. Um, we're always looking for things like that, things along those lines, and. Um, you know, just be creative as we go forward and stuff. Yeah, I, um, going back to this stuff, I've been trying to understand how this came, came out of nowhere and all of a sudden it's the big issue right now. But what is the real problem? Is it the stopping or is it the frisking? Because I can drive down the street right now, an officer can stop me and uh, maybe on the premise that my tail light is out, he can ask for my identification, which I'm protected under the First Amendment right to privacy, but I'm supposed to comply. So, where's the where's the line? I mean, how do you get so escalated? When you do have a right to stop anybody you want. I mean, uh, it happens all the time. Is it the frisking that's the problem? I think it's a little deeper than that. I, think I mean, by goes. the way, if you if you see something suspicious in my car, you could ask me to get out. You could ask him to open the trunk. You can do everything in my car. I mean, where, why is that different? Well, it's different in a couple of aspects. It is most law-abiding people understand. Most law-abiding people understand. Bumps to help yourself, we understand. What? Do your job, and you'll get that all the time. Work in the first precinct, bank gets robbed, you know, guy's wearing a suit. Well, there's a lot of suits walking around down the first precinct. Well, man, Wall Street area, there's suits every place. Stop any individual down there wearing a suit. You may annoy him. He may be on his way someplace. But chances are, I understand, obviously, I just come up from a meeting and, you know, yeah, there's, there's hundreds of blue stripe ties out there. They, you know, no problem. And you'll get that. Why? Because most law abiding people understand and they want you to catch the bad guy. They do. The deeper component to this is money. There are bottom feeders out there that can make money on a consistent, everyday basis off of the actions of police. And the people who scream the most are generally the people who are committing the crimes. If you look at office, and this was just in a paper a couple of weeks ago, Brooklyn North, um, Brooklyn North Narcotics. Kelly promoted a sergeant who was, uh, I think, sued 16 times. And he let this guy get promoted. And I spoke to the reporters, well, obviously he doesn't care that he promoted this guy. I said, well, obviously, if you knew Kelly, he really went through this guy's background and knows that this is a bunch of garbage. In narcotics, if you arrest someone, they make a complaint against you. They sue you. That's what they do. Pimps do the same thing. Prostitutes do the same thing. Why? Because it's an everyday occurrence. So what they begin to do is create a pattern of you being corrupt, you taking money, you're kicking my door, things along those lines. And then when this group of people gets involved with their lawyers, they find ways to sue. Now, some people come up with legitimate ways to sue. You, know, you, you stop them too many times, and they think they have a good issue, and they really did have a good issue. But it's not an issue that has a lot of substance to it with truth. And it's being um, portrayed in the wrong way right now. Because the, the component <coughs> to which I explained previously is completely being locked out of the loop. And at the end of the day, people are going to die. That's the end of the day. So you may be happy that we're going to reduce the stops and that you stuck it to the NYPD, but ask that mom, ask that person, or any person who's been a murder victim that you can't ask, do you think they would have traded everything in the world in to have a cop walk through that door? Do you think that baby that was all in the newspapers about a month ago, a one-year-old was shot uh, while they were aiming for the father, the father ran. Do you think someone was hoping today that they stopped that other guy with a gun around the corner before he came? You know, hey, there's a man black with a gun. I can't stop him. This is a man black. That's the difference in what takes place. And you can't change that. That kid's, that kid's dead. Well, what is the illegality? The stop them or the person? None of it. Is illegal. 
It's how it's done. Where NYPD fell short was in the documentation of it. The, an officer makes a stop and puts down the basics instead of explaining in greater detail that this individual is at a narcotics problem location, um, can't stop and search you for narcotics, even though you're at a narcotics problem location. I can stop you for weapons. But if I'm selling narcotics, chances are I may have a weapon. But as I'm making that inquiry of whether you're selling narcotics, Terry vs. Ohio allows me to make sure I'm safe. So I'm allowed to stop you, question you for narcotics. I'm allowed to make sure I'm safe. And in the course of that, oh, I come up with a gun. That happens. I don't come up with a gun. Cop is safe. That's the purpose of the law. So it's not illegal to do it. Vehicles are different because vehicles are mobile. Your car could be in Georgia 10 hours later today. So we're allowed to go through that car and, and stop. We'll ask, you know, can we search your car? They'll say no. But we have, you know, reason that we can do it and we'll go to the next level. So you can, if I refuse to let you look in my car, you can find a car and take me in until I'm, it's resolved. On a motor vehicle, the guy doesn't want to be frisked, right? You should just take them in until it's resolved. If you don't want to be frisked, if you resist being frisked, and I'm questioning you right now, your, your paperwork doesn't match your car. My level of suspicion has been raised. Now I have to wonder, who are you? What are you doing? So you may be lying. If this may go there. You refuse to be frisked in the process of it. Start resisting with that. It leads to another charge. You go into disorderly conduct. You go into um, you know, uh, assault if it gets that far. You know, you're, you're fighting back. It'll just escalate. You know, and the easiest thing, you'll always tell good people, or good people, they just, no problem, officer. You know, you want my, here's my keys. You know, they'll go that far. During the stop and frisk, is it ever a point where somebody would call it in right away? Like, let me just check on who you are just to see if maybe there is something outstanding. You know, if you're good here with this call, we'll let you go. Everything's fine. I'm sorry for bothering you. Would that be part of the protocol? It, it can be. It just depends on where. Depends on the situation. Sixth sense. An officer can put a, an individual in a car who's right. not the person. Say, sorry we delayed you. Let me get you to the train. That could happen too. Right. Um, you can get a phone call. If you, you just came to see your mom, she lives in this building, you may know. That can happen. Right. And it does happen. It doesn't happen every time, but it can happen. And everything changes. So each situation has changed. Like, um, you know, I'll call your mom. Oh, I don't have a number. Okay, here we go back to, you know, ground zero again. So it, it all has different variables. To right. It. Um, it's organic. It grows with each situation. It does. Each situation is different. Right. Okay. So on the citizens, uh, on, on the stop and frisk, have you ever thought about taking a citizen's patrol with you out in the neighborhood, or is it just too dangerous? It's not really practical. Um, a citizen's patrol, we have auxiliary cops, number one. Right. No, I mean like neighborhood people. I'm talking about like knuckleheads like Al Sharpton grabbing somebody, come see what we Sharpton deal with all the time. Yeah. You know, the problem, I don't know if you're going to get too many cops wanting to ride around with people like Al Sharpton. Um, yeah, I buy it. The, the, the problem is that Al Sharpton is not credible. Right. And there are other black community leaders who are highly credible. Right. And we need to speak to them. I personally think moms are your best ones to speak to. Right. I, I've worked in, in bad neighborhoods. The moms are going to work every day. You see them going into the subways, coming out of the subways. And when you go to the apartments to look for their son or to tell them something's happening, they're generally the person you're talking to. And they they don't know mom wants their kid to be killed. Right. No, no dad wants that to happen. Mom just seems to care a lot more for some reason. And I, I think they need to get more moms involved. And the schools, uh, New York City public schools, honestly, they're atrocious. And we're failing there, which is the seed for the future. So we're losing it at that level. Right. That's a problem. Got one more quick question for you. You're hitting up all the cops Christmas time for five dollars. Why not go more to the private sector and get more private sector people involved? I can't see why the private sector wouldn't want to contribute and help out, especially if they're conducting business in a certain area. They must be thrilled that hey, my clients can come to this area. It's clean. It's great. 
I, I mean, we're going to do that. The the sergeant I told you about, he did that in one precinct. I'm in a different position where I can take this on a much larger scale. Um, I, I meet people every day, and I have the ability to hold a press conference and reach out to corporate America with credibility of, no, we're a real organization. We're going to do something real and legit. If you do the research on the Sergeant's Benevolent Association, we're a 1,000% legit on the things we do. We're going to hit a ball over the fence. It's going over the fence. I, I don't get involved in nonsense. Um, all the people that work for us are highly credible people. You know, my brother's not the attorney, as you see in a lot of labor unions. You know, he gets all the house closing. It doesn't happen. You know, we have high-level people who work for federal judges, um, you know, well-established credibility. So when we get to the point of executing Blue Christmas citywide, we're going to have a partnership with corporate America. Uh, as I said, I had the NFL involved in it. Um, they were all for it. Uh, I think Macy's was getting involved. Um, you know, it, it's a big reach. And ultimately, I would like to take it nationwide, but 100% of the proceeds has to go to the cost. Because we can do that. I have staff working. We can work extra. We don't need to make money in the process of doing it. But 100% goes to the cost. Oh. I got you. I'm done. <laughs> okay. Um, back to stop it for a second. Um, the city asked Judge Scheinman to delay her remedies until the appeals process was over. She wouldn't do it. She said, well, it's clear that um, stop and frisk doesn't affect the crime rate because both stop and frisks and crime have been going down for the past year. So I wanted to ask if you want to respond to that. I, I, Judge Shinlin's part of her answer was that she's only asking for a meeting um, with the uh, monitor that she's appointed. Yeah. Okay. So in that aspect of it, I don't think that that's such a bad thing in that aspect of it. Her logic to her decision of well, both crime and stop and frisk have been going down in the past year is ludicrous. She just doesn't understand the system and what's taking place. Of course stop and frisk went down in the past year. She made it go down. Okay. The impact it had to crime. Um, we don't know whether it's going to or it's not. If you look at last week's paper, last week's statistics, mm -hmm. shootings are up, guns are down. So does Judge Shenlin want to take back the position and change it this week? It's probably going to happen down the line with the appellate division anyway, but I, I don't see the real impact of it. No. You never say that about a federal court judge. <laughs> yes? I have a question. Considering this looks like racial profiling from several areas, is there a way that like community leaders could speak to people and say, "Well, how does this not look so negative?" You know, because I was, you know, if I was Muslim walking down the street and anybody could just stop me, and and I think what happens is that it gets escalated so quickly due to emotion on both sides. So is it training so that these cops don't get as you know like riled? So that it we doesn't escalate training. like this? Because if somebody starts like cursing you and like, who the hell are you to stop me for no reason? I think the emotion gets so escalated that people go, you know, on both sides. We get training in the academy. We have a community affairs division that in areas where there's protest, things like they go into these areas and we spread them out so that there's that neutral barrier that occurs. What's missing is a link missing. the component of we stopped you because you're Muslim. Well, white Irish guys are not blowing planes out of the sky. It's not happening. Who would you like me to stop? Let's reverse profile. I'm going to stop Muslims, but I'm going to make sure I get 15 white Irish guys in front of For what? That's the reverse of it. Our Constitution and the greatness that's been developed by this country for freedom and people speak and doing things has a window that's open where there's no reverse in certain things at a certain point of having common sense understanding. It doesn't make sense. The world's talking about stop and frisk, but no one's objecting to being stopped getting on an airplane. 
you're going through x-ray machines. I get pulled aside every time I use my police ID to fly. Every time. If I use that, I get stopped and, and searched. If I use my driver's license, they don't search. It makes no sense. I should get to the front of the line, but it makes no sense. But that's okay. Because I'm not willing to come down 36,000 feet for blast. But we don't object to that. But isn't that stop and frisk? Exactly what's taking place. And profile. But we're not allowed to profile on that. Great. Can I? Grandma's coming in, 85 years old in a wheelchair, get her up. We're going to search her. Okay, when was the last time Grandma blew a plane out of the sky? You know? Most terrorists are retired by the time they get to our age anyway. It just doesn't make sense. That this is not, it goes to, if I'm a fisherman, I go to the ocean. And the logic to it is missing. You didn't even mention Israel earlier. The LO profiles. And people accept it. Why? Because there's no country in the world that's been living with terrorism on in Israel. And they just are not going to accept it. And everybody is in support of a sacred society. 